Hi, I'm Siobhan Sarna, founder of SIBO SOS. What a pleasure to have you all here mm -hmm. with our very special guest, Dr. Mark Pimentel. So he's currently the head of Pimentel Labs and executive director of the Medically Associated Science and Technology Program at Cedar sinai This program focuses on the development of drugs, diagnostic tests, and devices related to the conditions of the microbiome. He is in the process of what I think, and I like to say, of finding the cure for SIBO. Uh, the lab, Pimentel Lab, researches irritable bowel syndrome, one of the most prevalent GI conditions affecting about 10% of the population worldwide and about 10 to 15% of the pop in the US. In the past, there was no definitive test to diagnose IBS. And for the first time now, there is called IBS Smart. There are also three different kinds of gases that make you quote unquote have SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, and he has also created a test for that called Trio Smart. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to him and have him explain to us all of this so we can figure out what is going on with our gut. Hi, thank you for being here again. I'm so thrilled. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's a great pleasure to see you and, and congratulations on the book again. So that's thank terrific. You. Um, so what I plan to do today is just to take you through some slides. Really, it's not about the slides, it's about how the slides uh, sort of guide the conversation or at least the education about SIBO. And so I'll, I'll try and walk you through these slides uh, carefully. So shall I share my screen? Please do. Yep. I'm just checking to make sure that all of our streams are working. Yep. And they are. Okay, great. And, and by the way, if someone is listening to this on a podcast versus seeing it in the Facebook Live or the Zoom session, we'll give you a link so you can actually see the slides as well. Well, here they are. So I think you can probably understand it just from my conversation part of this, but I, I really like the slides are a very good guide for, for those who are able to see them live. But I'm going to talk about the irritable bowel syndrome and the microbiome because really things have dramatically shifted in 2020. Uh, we now know more about the microbiome and IBS, and there's more and more evidence that the microbiome is important in IBS, and I'll share some of those new, new things with you. So one thing I like to start with is IBS, you are irritable. So the terminology we use for IBS, that you're an irritable and you're a bowel and you're a syndrome, are really sort of derogatory terms. They're not really embracing of the patient experience. And the fact that you're called a syndrome implies that you're not a real disease, you're just a syndrome. And that there really is no understanding of IBS. And, and that's the part I really don't like. And I think the terminology needs to change. I really recently did a Twitter poll on this concept, whether they you know, the public or doctors, whoever would respond in Twitter would, would consider this derogatory to consider it a syndrome rather than a disease. And it was overwhelming that both patients and physicians alike felt that this terminology really did not represent what was going on for patients. And it also implied a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, what that means, a diagnosis of exclusion, for those of you who may not be familiar with this term, it means that this disease is the wastebasket. After you ruled everything else out, after you've done all your tests, you're left with this. You have changes in your bowel function, you have uh, bloating, but we don't know what causes it, we can't see anything in your IBS. And that also drives a problem because you, you end up getting a lot of investigations, you never feel comfortable with your diagnosis, you're never sort of settled and say, okay, I know I have IBS. No, you don't because there's no test for it or there hadn't been. And so that's the term diagnosis of exclusion. What does that end up for you as a patient? It means you're going to run around and see doctors and spend more money and doctors are gonna be doing more tests, all of which are negative, And then you're still gonna end up in the same place. So we'd like to put an end to that. And that's part of the story of the microbiome here. Here's another uh, ridiculous concept, but this was something that was quite common, especially in the 1990s and before, that IBS, and, and I'm quoting here, this is not my quote, this is somebody else's quote, uh, that IBS is a disease of hysterical women. So IBS was, quote, attributed to women. Well, that seems like blaming women for this condition that nobody understood or that it was due to some previous traumatic event or psychological event, or it's due to depression, or it's due to anxiety, or it's due to all these different things. 
for lack of a better understanding of the condition. And it's, this is a, certainly not a, uh, an appropriate way to refer to irritable bowel syndrome, uh, one would think. And so I want to leave you, not leave you with that thought, but I want you to start you with that thought. Not to mention, there's no shortage of patients to study. I mean, if you wanted to do research on IBS, you just need to walk down the street and you pass a bunch of people as you're walking. So it's not a rare disease. 40 million people in the US, 1 billion people worldwide. Research could have easily been done for decades, but we were left with that previous comment I mentioned. It is the most expensive disorder in gastroenterology because of the diagnosis of exclusion terms that you do all these tests, they're all negative, you waste all this money, the patient pays the copay in the US and, and also, you know, so on and so forth. I've had patients come to me and say that they out of pocket have paid $20,000 before they finally got to the diagnosis. But it's expensive, not because of the testing. It's expensive because of this notion of the Rome criteria, which are the previous criteria for diagnosing IBS, stating or part of their mantra was it was a diagnosis of exclusion. So it's up to you, doc. If you feel comfortable and you've done everything you want, you need to do and it's negative, you can call it IBS and that doesn't serve the patient well. It's expensive. Well, we're now in 2021. So let's fast forward to 2021 and this, this concept here that we now know food poisoning causes IBS. I'm gonna show you that evidence. <clears throat> we now know a toxin in food poisoning is important to the development of IBS. And that that creates autoimmunity to a protein in your body called vinculin. And then you get a change in the nerve structure or nerve function of the gut, meaning the gut is slower or it changes its flow patterns. And when it changes its flow patterns, you get buildup of bacteria and that's bacterial overgrowth. And therefore IBS is SIBO and SIBO is IBS in a sense. And I'll, I'll walk you through what I mean by that. But we're gonna start with the bacterial part of this, the bacterial overgrowth part of IBS and specifically talk about SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Now I want you to focus on those three letters, so small intestine, which is the small intestine, which is the part in the middle here. Uh, about 15 to 20 feet of the small of the bowel is small intestine. About three to five feet is colon or large intestine. But the small intestine is where you do all your absorption. You can take the whole human colon out and a human will survive just fine. It'll be runny, but you would survive just fine because the small intestine is where you absorb things. That's your most important part of the gut. So and that part of the gut is meant to be cleaner, less bacteria, less bacteria eating your food, you get most of it. And so the number we now refer to as normal is less than 1000 bacteria per one milliliter of fluid in the small bowel is the normal range. Now, when we're diagnosing small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, it requires a breath test. Now you could culture the small bowel but then you'd have to have a scope and a scope would have to be placed in there, suck some juice out and send it to the lab, all of which is expensive and invasive and you have to be put to sleep or, or at least given some form of sedation. So easier is a breath test. You simply ingest a sugar and then the sugar gets into your stomach and into the small intestine. And then you expel the gases that are produced by the bacteria in the gut in your, through your lungs and then out your breath. And that's how a breath test is done. Now, SIBO has been a problem in the sense that there have been no guidelines or consensus on how to interpret a breath test because, and, and for those of you who've had breath tests, there are doctors who say, well, it's got to rise by 10 or 12, or it's got to rise by 20 parts per million, or it's got to rise by 60 minutes or 90 minutes on the breath test. And so we set out in two papers, the first paper I don't have listed here was the North American consensus, which set the standards for how you should be doing breath testing, how you should be interpreting that breath testing. But because of the tremendous interest, and I mean this sincerely, tremendous interest in, in, in the gastroenterology community about SIBO, they, the American College of Gastroenterology commissioned the guideline, which is presented on this slide, and we confirmed a lot of the things in the North American consensus, but a very important part of the guideline said, 
for those of you who know about methanogens or methane, methane is another form of overgrowth. So there's a hydrogen form, a methane form, and a third form of hydrogen sulfide. And I'll promise I will get to that. But the methane part, those bugs aren't bacteria. So when you look at small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, that doesn't fit. So we created a new term called EMO, intestinal methanogen overgrowth. And that's the new term. So SIBO is now being broken down into maybe three parts and you'll see those parts momentarily. But we also said you should consider breath testing in the diagnosis of SIBO and IBS because the evidence is now quite overwhelming and I'll show you what that evidence is. So using this Venn diagram, we now think SIBO accounts for 60% of the diarrhea and mixed IBS. So in other words, 60% of people with diarrhea mixed would have a hydrogen positive breath test. That doesn't mean that all of IBS is caused by SIBO. A part of IBS is caused by SIBO, not all of IBS. And so we now think it's 60% and I'll show you the data to substantiate that. But SIBO is caused by IBS in a bulk of cases, but anything that slows the intestine down. So if the intestine is slower, whether it's because you have scar tissue or adhesions, whether it's because you're on narcotics that slow the gut down, you have long-standing diabetes with nerve problems from the diabetes, many things can cause SIBO and, and um, not just IBS. But IBS is such a huge disease space, 40 to 60 million in the US, that it probably encompasses the vast majority of SIBO. But there are three types of IBS. So going back to IBS, there's the diarrhea IBS, there's the mixed, which is the middle. Mixed means you're going back and forth between diarrhea and constipation. And then there's the constipation side of IBS. But essentially what we're seeing is two conditions because of the microbiome uh, findings we're having that methane on the breath test is, and methane or methanogens in the intestine is associated with constipation. And then the diarrhea mixed is associated with more on the hydrogen and now hydrogen sulfide side. This is, um, there's two Shaw's in the literature in gastroenterology and everybody mixes them up. So I call this the other Shaw paper, <clears throat> but this is a, a Shaw from Australia, a very prominent group, Nick Talley, previously from the Mayo Clinic. He's now the chancellor of Newcastle University, I think is where he's at. He's, he's a very prominent figure in Australia and a very prolific researcher. But basically this was a pivotal moment in 2020 because essentially this paper says for the first time, IBS full stop is associated with SIBO based on breath testing. And is 25 papers summarized in this document and, and it's clear, done full stop. So now that may surprise you that we're saying done now when we knew this two decades ago, but look, it, it, you have to continue to march forward. And then as people summarize the data, they start to see the pattern. Now, the challenge we had with trying to understand SIBO and its relationship with IBS or just SIBO in general is the challenge with the breath test. So the breath test emerged <clears throat> probably in the 1980s. And the original breath test only measured hydrogen. And then later methane was added, but there was no real understanding of what methane was related to. And then it wasn't, and, and so, but the understanding of the gas dynamics just wasn't complete with the breath test, hence the challenges with breath testing. But let me show you in graphically that you've got the hydrogen bacteria, which are producing hydrogen, and they're flooding the environment with hydrogen. And that's what they do. But that hydrogen is like a fuel for other organisms. So the methane organisms or the methanogens use four hydrogens to make one methane. So if you have methane on your breath test, which we can now measure with regular instruments, you can't rely on the number for hydrogen because four of the hydrogens are going to one methane. So the more methane you make, the less hydrogen you're gonna have on the breath test. So the hydrogen becomes unreliable on that test. But there were also patients where the breath hydrogen and methane were zero across the board. And we always suspected that there was a third gas and that third gas is hydrogen sulfide produced by hydrogen sulfide producers, otherwise known as sulfate reducing bacteria. 
and they use five hydrogen to make one hydrogen sulfide. So the point of this slide is simple. If you don't measure all three gases, and these are the only three gases that they produce, you don't get the complete picture. Because if you don't measure H2S, you can't rely on hydrogen because you don't know how much is making H2S. If you don't measure methane, you can't, you can't understand that methane is causing constipation, which I'll get to also. And we now know hydrogen sulfide is associated with diarrhea. So without measuring all three gases, you can't understand the full patient profile. As a consequence, breath testing can be confusing without understanding these three gases. Okay, now we're gonna take a step backwards and say, okay, well, what about culturing the bowel? Do we have proof that uh, of SIBO based on culture? In IBS, we do, all the way back to 2007. And you can see this study from Sweden. Clearly, the orange bar is IBS, the gray bar is healthy controls, and the orange bar is much higher, which means that there's a lot more bacteria or a lot more patients with SIBO in, I, in IBS than in controls. Taking that one step further, this study took people who were coming in for scope. So these were sick people, all of them. So the control group in the gray, they're sick people, they're not healthy controls, but the diarrhea IBS patients in the orange, 60% had SIBO. So that's where we get our 60% number from, is from this study. Now, we know more about SIBO and we continue to know more, and I'll show you some really interesting stuff here in, in a moment that's new. But when we took these duodenal aspirates, this juice from the small bowel, these two characters came out of the mix, Klebsiella and E. coli. Now, it doesn't look like Klebsiella is a lot higher than the gray healthy, but each number on this y-axis is 10 times higher. So this is a log 10 scale. So when you go from four to five, it means there's 10 times more bacteria. So E. coli, Klebsiella are bad actors. Now, what we were saying in 2015 is that E. coli and Klebsiella were like weeds in the garden, that they were choking other things out. Now, that was just us hypothesizing as to why these two characters are so problematic in SIBO and what was happening. But I have proof now that that is true. And we get this proof from what's called the reimagined study. The reimagined study at Cedars is anybody coming for a upper scope, we offer them the opportunity to be part of this study. We collect their information, they do questionnaires, we get blood, we get genetics, we get juice from the small bowel, and a couple of biopsies from the duodenum from the small bowel there. And then we're able to archive that and study the microbiome. And we've gotten almost to 500 patients. So we have a very, very good understanding of the small bowel microbiome. And that's never been done before. The first provocative finding from our study, uh, the reimagined study was presented or published this past uh, July in Digestive Disease Sciences. It's actually made the cover of the journal the reason this is important is this is the first across the gut snapshot of what the microbiome looks like. So I wanna point a couple of things out to you because there are many people up out there doing stool testing for the microbiome. Yes, stool testing for the microbiome tells you the microbiome in stool, but you can see the colors represent families of bacteria and you can see the, the colors here, but look at the small intestine. You cannot get any understanding of the small intestine from stool because the small intestine is completely different than the stool. And that's my point here is that we now can see, but, but here's another point. As you go further down the gut, and we, these were patients who were getting double balloon endoscopy. So we were able to get almost to the end of the small bowel for these patients. The number of bacteria does not go up. We thought it did the profile of the bacteria doesn't slowly become closer to like colon. No, it just basically drops off a cliff. Everything in the small bowel looks very similar. And then it's until you cross the ileocecal valve, everything goes into this format or this, uh, this what looks like stool. So pretty remarkable to describe this for the first time. Okay, so now we could use sequencing of the bowel, which is the most greatest, latest, greatest technology for understanding the microbiome. And we can do this in the small intestine. And what we show here is SIBO. So these were patients, not with a positive breath test, but the pa these patients had literally SIBO by culture, which is considered the gold standard. And the other group is no SIBO. 
but immediately, and so I'll, let me just describe this so this is a little tricky to understand. The first ring is the kingdom of life, which is bacteria. That's why it's called Bact. And same on this side. The next level is the phylum. Phylum is the next breaking down of what type of bacteria are present. And you can see immediately, even at this super high level look, that proteobacteria, which I'll, you'll understand what proteobacteria is in a minute, is so much more in SIBO than in non-SIBO. As we get further out to the rings, and the second last ring is the genus, the last ring is the species, Klebsiella, and E. coli is this other gray ring, is all-encompassing in SIBO, and we see that here again. So the point is, we keep seeing the same thing over and over again, E. coli and Klebsiella, E. coli and Klebsiella. Those are the SIBO bad actors. The other amazing thing in this study uh, is that we were for the first time able to validate the breath test with lactulose. We didn't validate it with glucose. We don't do glucose. We validated it with lactulose. So if your breath test at 90 minutes rises to more than 20 on hydrogen, a few things are noted. It's the most specific for SIBO by culture. It's the most more specific for all of the factors along this line, meaning that even though some of the other factors had greater P value, better P value, this lined up the best. So that's my first point. Second point is I want to show you this last two columns. It also lined up that the bacteria of the small bowel when you had SIBO had increased metabolic function for hydrogen production seen on their metabolic pathway analysis. What does that mean? That means that the hydrogen in SIBO is coming from the small bowel, not the colon. This is the argument that's been forever. Well, the lactulose gets the colon and the hydrogen's coming from the colon because lactulose doesn't get absorbed. Nonsense. This, this study proves that the upreg there is upregulation of hydrogen in the small intestine in these patients. So a lot to dissect on this slide. I'm not going to get into too far into the weeds, but very, very interesting. So this was presented at the American College of Gastroenterology. It's an abstract that was presented. Not, it's a paper that's emerging. <clears throat> but what's important here? Okay. So this is called a sort of a community analysis or a network analysis. So when you look at the microbiome, there it's like a community. So you have doctors, plumbers, lawyers, and others. And in some communities, the more lawyers you have, the more jails you have, or the more plumbers you have, the more buildings would need plumbing you have. And so you can see relationships between things. And each circle represents a genus of bacteria. The larger the circle, the larger that particular organism is in popularity or number. But I put red circles around two, E. coli at 33 and Klebsiella 45. And they're small little circles in this beautiful community. And you can see it, it looks like a community. Very nice, lots of connections, lots of diversity. But look what happens when you have SIBO. In SIBO, E. coli is this circle, huge. 45 is Klebsiella, also much larger. And look what it does to the network. The network's broken down. There's less circles. It's not cohesive anymore. So not only is SIBO an overgrowth of E. coli and Klebsiella, their overgrowth continues to destroy the networks that are normal. And the bacterial community starts to collapse. And that's what you see very vividly here on this picture. And there's more details to this that are very complicated to explain. But these two pictures, I think, are pretty self-explanatory on what's happening when SIBO occurs. OK, so but there's the hydrogen SIBO, and then there's the EMA, which is methane. And we knew early on that methane seemed to be associated with constipation. Actually, it was the final figure in a paper from 2001 that I, that I wrote. And it was sort of, the, you, you know, you never look at the last figure of a paper because the meat is figures one, two, and three. Figure four is sort of like, oh, it's an, after, it's an afterthought or it's like a, uh, you know, backup story. But it was really important because we've continued to show that methane is associated with constipation as this shows. Not only that, 
methane is the cause of the constipation. It's not the bugs, it's the methane itself. Because if you infuse methane into, uh, in this animal model, you get 60% to 70% slowing of intestinal transit. Okay, so what do we do about SIBO? What's the best way to treat SIBO? Well, you can treat it with antibiotics, like rifaximin is the one of the ones that we use quite commonly. And, and that works very well for IBS. It's not approved for SIBO, it's approved for irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea, but we think it's due to the fact that they have SIBO and it works for up to three months. And the, the amazing thing about rifaximin is that 36% of people who got rifaximin, they stayed better after the treatment for in an indefinite period of time, which is, which is quite remarkable. Interestingly, the meta-analysis of antibiotics and IBS show that there are no unsuccessful trials. Every antibiotic trial in IBS shows that it works. And again, pointing to this being a microbiome condition. As you continue to use rifaximin, as rifaximin use went up, so did the referral to tertiary care centers for diarrhea and mixed IBS. And that was very interesting as well. But this is where I wanted to get to. What does that mean? Can you just restate what that means? So as you continue over a decade, this was a decade long period of time, as the use of rifaximin for IBS continued to increase, our hospital was seeing less and less referrals for Got mixed it. diarrhea IBS. Okay. So that means things were happening in the community, doctors were giving it and we were seeing less. Now, in one of the trials, we saw that breath testing was associated with the response to rifaximin. So in other words, even though rifaximin is approved for IBS, not SIBO specifically, if your breath test, first of all, all patients, 44% respond. But if the breath test was positive before they started rifaximin, 56% responded to rifaximin. And if the breath test became negative, you, you had a positive breath test, rifaximin made the breath test negative, you're the best outcome. You had 76% chance that you met that crazy, very difficult FDA endpoint. For methane, it's also interesting. You give neomycin plus rifaximin and you get the best response. This was a double blind study. Everybody gets antibiotics in this study. This group gets neomycin with placebo, but this group gets the combination of neo and rifaximin. You can see the constipation score after treatment is much lower when you take these two antibiotics. And this is why we, we in our practice, use neomycin and rifaximin for methane and, neomy and rifaximin alone for the hydrogen side. Bloating got better with this cocktail, but forget about the antibiotic. The most important thing in the patients with methane who have constipation is getting their methane less than three because that was clearly what made it most effective. Okay, now the new kit on the block. So this is a new device that measures hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. And the, the challenge for hydrogen sulfide is this. The, the, the hydrogen sulfide gas is highly volatile and toxic. Even hydrogen and methane are not easy to transport over long distances. So you need to, needed to change all the sensors and array them in a particular fashion in the instrument. You had to uh, have a transport system to be able to transport the gas without any of the gases deteriorating, which is not easy, especially with hydrogen sulfide. And then do clinical trials to prove what the cutoff is that's ideal. But to just to show you, these sensors in this instrument are sensitive to 0 0.2 ppm not 2 ppm, 0 0.2 ppm. 2 ppm are the older instruments. And it correlates perfectly with older instruments. That's not the question. That, that we know already for hydrogen and methane. But hydrogen sulfide is new. So for the first time, and, and you mentioned TrioSmart, that's the test. We can measure all three gases, do it at home. It transports perfectly without any deterioration in any of the gases, and you get your result. Remember, hydrogen sulfide correlates with diarrhea, methane correlates with constipation, and by not knowing all three, you really have an incomplete understanding of your SIBO. Now, I know I'm talking about the IBS story here, and I know it feels like I'm, I'm drifting back and forth between IBS and SIBO, but it's all the same thing because of this pattern that I showed you earlier. But I'm now going to talk about how food poisoning causes IBS and SIBO. 
because we had a big paper last year. If in 2020, this paper came out in 2017, so I should say if in 2017 you don't realize that food poisoning causes IBS, then you need to read this paper because this is from the Mayo Clinic. It summarizes more than 40 papers. But the point is, if you had a case of food poisoning, you develop IBS 11% of the time. So one in nine people who experience food poisoning gets IBS. We, there's no argument here anymore. Uh, food poisoning causes IBS. It's not all of IBS though. Remember, there's 100 people with IBS coming in your office who have diarrhea because their colonoscopy is negative. There's many things that could cause that patient. But in that group, 60%, it's food poisoning. But I get this question all the time is, well, I don't remember ever having food poisoning, but you're having diarrhea now. So you obviously have diarrhea from day one. You don't know if that was food poisoning or not. And now you still have diarrhea, which is your IBS. So you don't have to remember food poisoning for this to be true. And, and that's why the blood test becomes super important. But the risk factors for food poisoning the top three are the top three. The severity of the food poisoning. If you had seven days of diarrhea, if you had fever, if you had to get admitted to hospital, you're way more likely to get IBS. But look at number two. This is not a disease of hysterical women. This is women are more susceptible to developing IBS from food poisoning. And as you'll see, it's an autoantibody that occurs and women tend to get more autoimmune diseases in general, rheumatoid arthritis at lupus and so forth. So we're starting to understand why women, more women have IBS because of this mechanism of action. So this is animal work, so I don't wanna to get too deep in this, but basically we created the first animal model where we gave Campylobacter food poisoning to a group of rats and the other rats just got nothing. They just continued on their way. And then we were able to see after three months after they recovered from the food poisoning, what they had and the rats got SIBO. So 27% of the rats who got Campylobacter now have SIBO, but they had food poisoning. So food poisoning causes IBS, but food poisoning causes SIBO. And so could it be the same mechanism for IBS in terms of its relationship with SIBO? Not only that, if the rats got Campylobacter and they developed SIBO, more than 80% of them had weird bowel patterns weird wet weights of their stool, meaning they developed IBS in general. The, you won't, we don't have criteria for IBS in rats, but that's what happened. And they got what's called increased rectal lymphocytes. So these are white cells, a small increase in number in the rectum of these animals. And this is the one thing that's found in humans with post-infectious IBS. So one toxin in common with all food poisonings called CDTB. And we don't think C. diff has this toxin very often, but I put it here because it occasionally can. C. diff can precipitate IBS. So cytolethal distending toxin. This is the toxin that we think is super important for the development of IBS and SIBO in general. So we did another study where we created a Campylobacter food poisoning that was missing this toxin. Oh. Dr. Pimentel, when you're moving your mouse around, no pun intended, because there's a mouse on the screen, I get that. Um, it's just kind of messing around with a, a microphone. It's coming across as really staticky. Okay, all right. I'll try not to move too quickly. Okay, thanks. All right, so I won't move my mouse around anymore because I don't want to create static. Um, so Campylobacter in the middle is missing the toxin. Campylobacter on the left has the uh, toxin. And then on the right, let's say you're going someplace where chances of getting Campylobacter are very high. If you took Rifaximin with every meal, could you prevent IBS? And the answer is Rifaximin works great. Not having the toxin works great as well. So we knew the toxin was important, but this is the study that was published just in the last six months. And it's very important because what we did was we said, okay, well, maybe you don't need Campylobacter. Maybe all you need is the toxin. And so we injected the toxin into the back arm of the, or leg of the rat to see if they would develop IBS. And they developed anti-CDTB antibodies because we gave them CDTB toxin and they developed autoimmunity to themselves to vinculin. And so vinculin is an important protein on the nerves of the gut that help the nerves stay together, stuck together. 
Not only that, these animals developed SIBO and they developed a change in, in their wet weight of their stool because they were developing IBS. So we could make an animal have IBS just by giving the CDTB toxin. So it works like this. You have the cytolethal distending toxin, you get exposed to food poisoning and you see this toxin, your body reacts to it and produces antibodies. But one part of CDTB looks like vinculin and then you form antibodies to yourself. And that was supposed to go onto the vinculin and it didn't, it flew past. But yes, that's what happened. So we took that idea and we said, well, we need to develop a test. Could we diagnose IBS that you got it from food poisoning? You don't need a colonoscopy. You don't need to waste all that resources. And within 48 hours to a week, you know if you have IBS using anti-CDTB and anti-vinculin? And the answer is absolutely. And we see that here that in the red bar is anti-CDTB and the red bar here is anti-vinculin. And this is Crohn's and ulcerative colitis patients and it's head and shoulders above. So we could actually diagnose this and the post-test probability, which is really important. If you have the test and the test is positive, it's about 90% likely you have IBS. The specificity is also high, over 90%. So I was very, um, I was graced with the ability or the, the opportunity to be part of the Irritable Bowel Syndrome Guidelines for the American College of Gastroenterology. And one of the mandates that was set by this guideline is we need to have a positive strategy, positive diagnostic strategy. IBS should not be a diagnosis of exclusion. That is dismissive to patients. It is suggesting that IBS is not a real disease. And it's a step in the right direction to maybe changing that syndrome word to something else because it really is a disease and these patients suffer immensely. And, and they suffer at, often at an age when they should be more productive because this can affect people in their 20s all the way up to you know, their 80s. So this is the sequence. I tried to show you as much of the evidence as I could. Uh, obviously, we did a SIBO symposium a couple of years back and uh, it was eight hours of broadcast. So I'm covering a lot of ground in a short period of time, but I hope you know I was able to at least express to you a lot of the most important parts and, and some of the more interesting parts that have happened more recently. But people ask me, well, what do you do in clinic? What do I do in clinic? And so I actually created this in terms of how SIBO and the IBS blood testing fits into my clinic, not in the whole spectrum of what I do because we see very complicated patients. But in the, in the case of chronic diarrhea patients where you know they've, they've had some degree of workup by the time they've seen me, you could just flat out give rifaximin. If, it, if they respond to rifaximin, it can't be Crohn's disease and it probably can't be celiac disease because you'd have to be off gluten for celiac to, to improve. And Crohn's disease doesn't get better in like 10 days or 14 days of an, anti, of an antibiotic. But I prefer to go down the middle path, which is I get the anti-CDTB and the anti-vinculin. And, and the second generation test, the IBS smart test is much more specific. There was a study that piggybacked to our, uh, CDTB inoculation study, this is from Mexico, and of course, food poisoning is quite common there. And Max Schmulsen noted that the new second generation test is much more specific for his uh, patients, and we see that as well, um, much more accurate. And I also do the three gas breath test, because if they have diarrhea, I want to know if they have hydrogen sulfide, because I can use that as a guide to treatment. Now, if the anti-CDTB antibody is positive, then I know they have post-infectious IBS with 90 plus percent specificity. I've got to counsel them about traveling, how to eat, what not to eat, what to be careful with, because if they get food poisoning again, and we've seen this in our clinic, the antibodies get higher and they're harder to treat. And when I put extreme measures, I'm talking about patients who are quite sick, that if you're traveling, you know, you, you should consider prophylactic antibiotics. That's what I do. Of course, it's not FDA approved. This is just the pattern practice that I, that I practice because I can't let them get higher on the, on the antibodies. 
Uh, of course, if they're negative, that's the patient that should have a colonoscopy. And I have lots of examples of where the test was negative and we found something. And so it, it, the test helps a lot. The three gas breath test, of course, if it's negative, again, consider further workup. So if you're negative on the blood test and you're negative on the three gas test, you're, you gotta move on, something else is going on. And that can be all determined within a week or 10 days. So very fast to get to this point and then consider other things, maybe a colonoscopy and other things. If you're hydrogen positive or you're hydrogen sulfide positive, I use rifaximin for hydrogen. I use rifaximin with bismuth, but there are a lot of emerging um, cocktails for hydrogen sulfide. So I'm not sort of married to this cocktail yet because I think we don't understand everything about hydrogen sulfide. So don't take this as gospel, but this is what I do currently. Can you explain uh, which bismuth you're using? Is it bismuth subnitrate? Is it Pepto-Bismol? Yeah, it's Pepto-Bismol right now. It's just the easiest for patients to understand and get. Um, there are people who get um, um, compounded bismuth and bismuth subnitrate and, and other, other uh, forms. I don't think it matters. I think it's the bismuth itself more than, than it is the formulation. And is it three swigs a day? Yeah, so rifaximin three times a day, bismuth three times a day. So what we do. And then chronic constipation, we do the three gas. You could do the two gas because if it's methane, you don't need three gases for that, but it's just convenient. And then if methane positive, I give rifaximin and neomycin. If it's methane negative, I consider further workup because something else is going on and I might do anal rectal testing and other things. I do consider a prokinetic for all of these situations after treatment because I want to prevent the need for antibiotics again if, it, if as much as possible and that's why a prokinetic can be beneficial. So the conclusion of my sort of presentation part of this is that IBS isn't part of microbiome disease. SIBO is an important contributor to IBS. That's clear from 2020. The meta-analysis from Shaw and Nick Talley from Australia really capstone this. They even had a paper, which I didn't present, that is again showing elevated bacteria in the small bowel of IBS. So, I mean, the data are pretty substantial and overwhelming. The most important organisms for SIBO, E. coli Klebsiella. E. coli Klebsiella, I showed you lots of data on that. Methane is associated with constipation. Hydrogen sulfide is the key to understanding SIBO more completely. If you don't have hydrogen sulfide, it's an incomplete picture. Rifaximin is the first treatment for a causative agent in IBS because we think that the bacteria are deranged as we went through, and you can give it repeatedly. Autoimmunity to spice, produced by CDTB to vinculin is, an import, is important in the pathogenesis of IBS. And so this is really sort of the... the the capstone of, of what's gone on 20 years of work to get to this very brief lecture, but, but you can see that we understand this more completely. I would say that we understand the starting point of IBS more than we do Crohn's or ulcerative colitis now with this, this work. I will say one last thing and then I'll open it up to questions or, or comments, but that quote I put at the beginning of the lecture where it says IBS is a disease of hysterical women, you know, we talk about in the 1980s and 90s where stress and psychology were the mainstay of IBS pathophysiological understanding, but that quote was from 2018. And that's the sad part because in 2018, we knew post-infectious IBS, we knew SIBO, we knew all these things, and yet there are still practitioners out there who haven't evolved into this new con these new concepts and, and still reside in the 90s and 80s. And, and that's unfortunate for patients who might see these, these practitioners. So. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pimentel. That was very illuminating and really comprehensive. Um, if anyone has any questions about the TRIO Smart Breath Test, go to e email page at support at TRIO smartbreath.com. And for the IBS smart test, please email patientcare at ibssmart.com. A lot of the questions we've been receiving could be answered through those emails. And because we have a limited amount of time, I wanted to give you another resource. So it's support at triosmartbreath.com. And then IBS um, smart questions is patientcare at ibssmart.com. We also, because you're part of the SIBO SOS community, have a special on the IBS smart test, which is 25% off and you don't need a doctor's script. You can use their in-house physician filling out the questionnaire at no extra charge. 
and um, be sure to look for your email that we will send to you because we'll put a link there. You can also find that at um, cbosos.com under, under the shop area. Okay, guys, Dr. Pimentel, here's a big question. Does, so just to clarify, does hydrogen SIBO exist? Because you've been talking about it, but there's this question about how the hydrogen feeds the methane. So is hydrogen SIBO a thing? Well, but every two years, I, I think I understand what's going on. And then I think about it some more and I understand it better. Um, so I showed you the figure that shows that using just hydrogen, that hydrogen predicts that you're going you're gonna to respond to rifaximin. So that throws a little wrench in the fact that hydrogen is important because you can't make hydrogen sulfide if you don't have hydrogen. So I think the starting point for SIBO or EMO is you have to have elevated hydrogen because you need the gas to make the other two, gar two cars go. Or the analogy I use is you need a lot of rabbits so that the wolf population or the coyote population is satisfied. And the wolves are meth methanogens and the coyotes are sulfate reducing bacteria to produce hydrogen sulfite. Interestingly, they don't like to exist together. So if the wolves are there, they're eating all the hydrogen and they don't want the other guys there. If the sulfate reducing bacteria are there, they tend not to want the wolves there. So usually the two don't go together. But as everything in medicine, there are examples of where that doesn't work. And some patients have hydrogen sulfide, methane, and hydrogen. And, uh, you know, so it's complicated. It is complicated. Okay. If you do get, uh, this is for Ramona, one of our longtime participants. Um, if you do get um, antibodies being positive from the IBS SMART test showing that the um, food poisoning episode has impacted your migrating motor complex. You have these antibodies and therefore you have post-infectious IBS slash SIBO. What do you do for treatment to impact the, um, the antibodies? Is there anything you do to help people with those antibody levels? So we have extreme examples of things we've done, uh, and but I don't recommend these for the general practitioner or even the regular gastroenterologist. But, you know, um, IVIG is something that we have used, uh, and IVIG seems to bring the antibodies down, and some people get better. Um, again, it's not it's not an FDA approved use, but it but it has worked. We've done plasma phoresis in some of the most extreme cases of distension and bloating, five cases, and their IBS completely disappears for a month. So the point of that is don't do plasma phoresis, please, none of you. Um, what I'm saying is that we know that if you get rid of these antibodies, it looks like IBS goes away. That's a super important finding. And we want we're not gonna publish that because we don't want people doing that because that's like dialysis. You can't put IBS patients or SIBO patients on dialysis to get their antibodies out. Plus they don't form antibodies if you do that. But it just goes to show you that we're really, really, really close to what could be the end story of how to make this better. And, and that's what we're working on. So stay tuned because there's always more to come. And in June of 2021, we already have our time booked for a two-hour conversation, thank you, um, after Digestive Disease Week, where hopefully you'll be making some exciting announcements. And we'll I'm exhausted to... already. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. Well, we're all very excited. Okay, if someone needs help with their doctor interpreting the results of the uh, Trio Smart breath test, how can we help them? Go get the support, like I, I gave the email, um, the email address a few minutes ago. I mean, I guess some people are getting their doctors to give them the test and then the doctors aren't totally being clear about the uh, interpretation that's coming. Some yeah, so I think the support from the company will give give guidance to the doctor or the patient as necessary. But, but um, yeah, there, there's a lot of things that can guide that clinician. There's review articles and other things that I think the company can provide uh, as guidance. So okay. not a problem. Okay, I'm just gonna ask this in a different way. I do the Trio Smart breath test. It shows high hydrogen. I have hydrogen SIBO, true? It shows high hydrogen sulfide. I have hydrogen sulfide. It shows high methane, I have methane. So once again, we're still, I'm still getting like barrage with these questions. So do I have hydrogen SIBO and should I treat it that way? 
versus treating okay. hydrogen sulfide SIBO? I know I keep asking you the same question. Just keep keep coming at me with yeah. an answer. So hydrogen sulfide predicts diarrhea. Methane predicts constipation. Hydrogen predicts just the general concept of SIBO. However, if you think about it, what we are there's going to be a different treatment. Rifaximin we know works well for hydrogen. Uh, neomycin and rifaximin, you can substitute metronidazole if you wish for the neomycin, works well for methane. For the hydrogen sulfide, we're still working that out and we're doing like a randomized control trial right now to see if this new thing works great for hydrogen sulfide or, or various forms of SIBO. So we're still, we're, we're coming to some conclusions on what will work best for hydrogen sulfide. But just to think about it another way, because I'm sure this question comes up, think about diet. So we think there might be actually three diets for SIBO, one for hydrogen, one for methane, and one for hydrogen sulfide, because if you go on a low sulfur diet, maybe that helps hydrogen sulfide. So there's a lot of things coming down the pipeline that we think will help you understand this better or help you treat your patients better. But it starts with knowing you have it and then exploring ways to make it better. And that's where we're at now. Uh, from one of your colleagues, Dr. Steven Sandberg-Lewis, if a patient has IBS slash IBD, say Crohn's and SIBO, how does IBS SMART distinguish that? They have both. So in our study with using the part of the, okay, so let me explain the sensitivity and specificity for the blood test. People say, well, it's a low sensitivity, 43 to 56% sensitive. Well, that, yeah, it can't be more than 56% sensitive because I already told you that out of 100 people that show up at your office, maybe only 60, it was due to food poisoning. So if you knew who had food poisoning, it would be 100% sensitive. So that's, I'm not worried about that. The specificity is more important that if you're positive, it started from food poisoning with more than 90% certainty. So th that's part of the test. Now, then on the other side of the equation, which is the point of the question, in the IBD group, the reason our specificity is 90 and not 100 is because 10% of people with IBD have a positive test, but 10% of all populations have IBS. Make sense? because 10% yeah. of the entire planet has IBS, right. including 10% of IBD. So you're always going to have a few patients who have IBS and IBD together. And that's why we can never get more than 90% specific with the test. So if you understand the statistics of things, you understand that the test is quite impressive given those, those discussion points. But, but what I think Dr. Sandberg-Lewis's point is, if you have both, how do you treat both? Well, you have to treat both in order to get the patient better because there are many patients, for example, with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. The primary treatment that's been used in the past is steroids. So patient goes to the doctor, they have IBD, they have Crohn's ulcerative colitis, they get whacked with steroids, a lot of side effects, Part of it gets better, but they still have bloating and a little bit of diarrhea. So the doctor says, well, let's go more steroids and more steroids. And then they do a scope and they see nothing. The Crohn's is gone. So they were jacking up the steroids, treating IBS on top of IBD instead of the Crohn's that was gone. So all of my point is knowing that they have both is really important too. So you don't jack up all these drugs that are harmful um, while you can just e easily treat both there. If someone has a breath test and only has hydrogen show up on that breath test, how should we interpret that? I still call it SIBO because it's E. coli and Klebsiella. And maybe the other two organisms, uh, maybe the rabbits are all by themselves. That's okay. okay. I treat it. Okay. When it comes to, um, okay, when it comes to the future and, um, Let's say, okay, so that's going to be revealed, you guys, in June, uh, hopefully with like high impact information. So hang in there. Go to SIBO SOS Facebook community because a lot of the questions that you guys are asking are answered there. Dr. Allison C. Becker and I created a course called the SIBO Recovery Roadmap, also tons of information there. And then we've done two masterclass summits, which Dr. Pimentel has participated in. You can find it all on SIBOSOS.com um, because your questions are amazing. We have covered a lot of them. This is sort of Dr. Pimentel's breaking news and, and comprehensive overview right now. Who 
often do you see people have negative SIBO breath tests and it's actually parasites or it's actually SIBO, small intestine fungal overgrowth? What do you think are the percentages? Yeah, so um, what I understand from Satish Rao, who does a lot of getting juice from patients where antibiotics have failed. So generally, if you're taking an antibiotic and it's not working, or you have a negative breath test and it's not SIBO, but everything else is negative, then you really ought to consider these other uh, options or possibilities. Obviously, if it's a parasite, you should look for it. Um, and and people do parasite testing. I do it, you know, at Cedars as well. But um, it's not my first thought because if you look at the data, and if you had a hundred consecutive patients coming in with IBS, it, most of them would not have a parasite, except for you know, blastocystis is somewhat common. But even in my population, we pick it up quite infrequently. So um, my point is. Parasites are not as common as SIBO itself. So to treat it that way first is probably your best bet. Again, it depends if the breath test is negative, then you can go at it and look for other things like that. Okay. And and so, because we do get people with negative SIBO breath tests and they're confused about, well, what else could it be? So you do suggest the scoping, a parasite test, and then you can't really easily test for SIBO for, for um, fungal overgrowth. But um, check out Dr. Satish Rao for all of that information. Yeah, and it, probably about 10% of his population, I, I'd have to ask him what his latest numbers are, but uh, could have CFO. And, and te the 10% of the patients he sees is different than the 10% of the general population because he's seeing patients that have been around the block a few times, as you know. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. When it comes to adhesions, because that is such a big proportion of people um, with adhesions who have SIBO, and if, uh, could you, in case someone's new, welcome, but could you explain what adhesions are and how, how do you treat adhesions? So adhesions are, you've had surgery. Sometimes you didn't have surgery. Maybe you had an appendix that got inflamed and healed on its own. You didn't even know. I've had cases like that. Uh, but you have scar tissue on the outside, in the cavity, but on the outer side of the bowel. And, and then basically it creates like a kink in the hose, like your garden hose, where the water doesn't flow through it that well. And then you get this buildup. Um, there are ways to, there's, there's sort of uh, therapeutic ways where massage and other uh, abdominal massage can break adhesions down. Hard to um, quantify that because you can't quantify adhesions to begin with. It's very hard to know. I mean, we've seen CT scans, everything looks normal. You go inside and there's adhesions everywhere. Uh, so you can't with regular radiology quantify adhesions, but um, that works or surgery, unfortunately, is sometimes the option we have to go down. In case someone's also fairly new, like they've been playing around with this whole hydrogen methane dominance and they're like, hydrogen sulfide, wait a minute, I didn't know about that. What are some of the symptoms to, su to suspect hydrogen sulfide? Yeah, the two main symptoms that the hydrogen sulfide patients have that the, uh, that the others don't have as much of is diarrhea and abdominal pain, those two. Hydrogen sulfide is pretty toxic, so it causes pain fibers to be um, amplified and, and then also the diarrhea, which we've shown already. And what about SIBO causing GERD, breaking news there? Well, so, you know, we long ago when we did what's called a factor analysis, so we broke IB SIBO down into two buckets. We didn't have the third. We didn't have hydrogen sulfide, two buckets at the time. <clears throat> Methane, it turns out, associated with constipation, we know it slow, slows the gut down, but we showed that because it's slowing the gut down, it was associated with more reflux than hydrogen SIBO. But anything that causes the ab abdomen to distend and create pressure means the pressure to back up into your esophagus is higher because esophageal reflux is pressure below the diaphragm relative to pressure above the diaphragm to make the acid come up. And if you increase that pressure below the diaphragm, that's when you get reflux. One minute to go. You know, I like to keep you on your schedule because I so appreciate you giving us so much time. Um, okay, there's a big uh, virus running around right now, and a lot of people are very interested in getting vaccinated. And I was just wondering if you've seen in your practice uh, any correlation with people with SIBO and IBS having an adverse reaction or any advice you have for us, this our gut patient population and the vaccine. 
So um, what we're seeing with, with the virus itself is a lot of patients are getting digestive symptoms. It ranges from 10 to 30%. The biggest question I get is, is, is COVID causing IBS? And, and we haven't seen that data yet. There are people who are, they call them long haulers, who they don't get better over time or they take a long period of time to get better. That's usually not the digestive part. It's more body aches, weakness, and, and these types of symptoms. But the virus can be in the gut phase. In terms so of the vaccine, have we have- again because it just bleeped. That was like a cliffhanger. The internet just went out. Say it again. The virus is in the gut. It can be in the gut and it can bind to ACE receptors in the gut. Um, so yes, the virus can be transmitted through stool. It's believed it, all of that is, is true during the acute or the, 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 when you have COVID, but in terms of the vaccine, we haven't seen any GI consequences of the vaccine that we know of, um, you know, just fatigue, fever, all of those sorts of things in the early days. So, so far, so good with the vaccine. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Pimentel. We'll look forward to speaking to you again after Digestive Disease Week. Keep up the fantastic work. We'll talk to you in June. And in the meantime, I'm gonna do my level best to get this information out to as many millions of people as possible. So thank you so much. Thank you. I'm gonna have Dr. Pimentel sign off and I'm gonna say thank you to everyone who has been here for this presentation from SIBO SOS. And if you have not gotten into our Facebook group, SIBO SOS Facebook, it's group. It's it's um, for those of you on the Zoom call and not on the Facebook live feed right now. I think it's SIBO SOS virtual community. Um, a lot of the questions that you all have been asking are fantastic, of course. Um, and SSL, I think you're going to have to ask him some of those questions directly. Um, water making you bloat. Dr. Pimentel has explained that before, where um, it's like a balloon from a, you know, kid's birthday party with a clown who's tying them up into different knots. It just has to do with the plumbing and the like tube. So yes, even drinking water can cause bloating if you have issues. Um, what I want to also let you know is that we have a whole library of Dr. Pimentel's previous presentations where a lot of these questions are also answered. We call it the Pimentel Chronicles and it is on uh, SIBOSOS.com. You can go to the resources area you can see an on-demand learning library, and there are tons of fantastic resources there. That is something I have not done a fabulous job of getting out to the world. It's a little bit hidden, and I'm working on getting that more out there. Um, they, a lot of times, are part of our summits, the, um, the SIBO Masterclass Summit, and then the Next Steps for Treating SIBO Masterclass Summit, which we just wrapped. You can find it all on SIBOSOS.com. Also tons of free resources at SIBOinfo.com, Dr. Uh, Allison Seebecker's website. The book, Healing SIBO, is going to be like the best 20 bucks you've spent on figuring out what to do next. It's based on everything Dr. Pimentel was talking about. On page 111 is the algorithm that um, so many people have followed that he started, then Dr. Allison Seebecker and Dr. Stephen Sandberg-Lewis added to and it's right here. That's also a free download on SIBOSOS.com. Okay, I'm gonna wrap it up. We are um, very appreciative of you. Thank you so much for being here, everybody. I really, really treasure you and wanna wish you the best. Do not give up. There's tons and tons of hope. He, Dr. Pimentel and his team are working like basically 24 seven to figure this out. I do think in June, there are going to be some revelations that we're gonna feel really good about, but that hydrogen sulfide, uh, um, treatment he just talked about with the Pepto-Bismol is terrific. Also, Dr. Seebecker, another world-renowned uh, SIBO specialist like Dr. Lisa Shaver, who's joined us today, and Dr. Steven Sandberg-Lewis, and so many more. Thank you guys for being here. Um, if you go to the SIBO SOS um, Facebook group and you look under files, tons of information there, including Dr. Seebecker's perspective on hydrogen sulfide treatments. Okay. Remember that if you sign up or, you know, I don't get a kickback or anything on this. If you want to do the IBS um, smart test, use the coupon SIBO SOS 2021 when you order it and you get 25% off, which is a huge, huge thank you so much to Jamelli Labs for that. And if you have any questions about the IBS smart test, which is the anti-vinculin uh, test and all of that for the 
food poisoning leading to SIBO. Um, do email patient care at ibssmart.com and Paige will help you. And then also for the, and the coupon is case sensitive. Oh, really? That's complicated. Okay, it's at capital S, lowercase I-B-O, capital S-O-S, 2021. That's complicated, sorry. Well, look for it on um, SIBOSOS.com because I think we have it typed up there really nicely. And then I was wanted to find the um, email address again for the anybody who wants to get their questions answered about um, the Creo Smart breath test, like directly from the lab itself. In international, he's they're working on it. I know that um, it's not it's not as prevalently available as as they wanted it to be as they want it to be. So they're constantly working on it. Paige, are you with me? Can you type that in the um, email address again? Here you go. Nope, that's yeah. Support at triosmartbreath.com. Support at triosmartbreath.com for the breath test, and then patient care at ibssmart.com. Love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if anybody's interested in the lymphatic system, my mom um, passed away in the 90s from lymphoma. And so with all of my gut work, um, in the back of my mind, I had another summit brewing and it's called the Lymphatic Rescue Summit. And if you're interested in that, um, please email us at info at SIBOSOS.com. Make sure you're on our email list. I'll send you out an uh, opportunity to sign up for that for free. That's happening in April. And so as a tribute to her, because we didn't know, and like I didn't know what was going on with SIBO. Like what's the lymphatic system in the nineties? No one knew. And um, I wanted to make sure no one went through what we went through. So that's a new summit that I'm doing. Also in September, I'm doing a summit on biological dentistry, the connection from the mouth, to the rest of the body and your amalgams and we're the only country that separates the mouth from the rest of the body. So it has been incredibly illuminating. I can't wait to share that with you. That's in September. And then next year I'm doing liver gallbladder summit. So be sure to stay on that email list and we will keep you posted. Okay. I'm going to wrap up Clarissa who's in the background. Clarissa, would you do me a favor and gather all the questions, um, throw it into a spreadsheet and let's see what we can do with those. And yes, you will have um, a replay sent to you on Friday. That's our goal. And yes, if you go into the Facebook group, you will find this recording. And yes, I'm going to have this transcribed so everyone can um, read what Dr. Pimentel is saying. If you're listening to the podcast, you obviously won't be able to right now see the slides, but we'll give you a link so you can go watch the video too. Peace, everyone. Thank you. Yes, we'll send all the URLs and website info. Sure, absolutely. I'm going to send you like, make it your life easier, all kinds of stuff. So I'll send you all the links that um, I was just trying to read and the coupon, but you can find that at SIBOSOS.com if you're really enthusiastic and want to find it sooner. Okay, bye.